Deep in southern India, a mysterious construction project is making the country's neighbours nervous. Some see it as evidence of an escalating arms race that could one day take the subcontinent to the brink of thermonuclear war. So what's going on behind these walls? We sent Indian journalist Mandakini Gallot to investigate. Goa, a coastal state in India, is famous for its sun, sand and tourists. But for five days in March this year, this beach paradise played host to India's Defence Expo. Let me express my satisfaction with the arrangement and request all of you to take advantage of uh, the huge display of various weapons, the technology display. Today, India is the largest importer of arms in the world and has pledged to spend $250 billion over the next decade to modernize its military. Hoping to cash in, arms dealers and companies from across the globe have flocked to the Defence Expo in the hopes of selling their tech to the Indian government. Hello, um, my name is Mandakini Gailor. Andre. Hello, Andre. Mandakini. Hi. At the forefront of India's military expansion, is the development of a fleet of nuclear submarines which will be powered by enriched uranium and capable of firing thermonuclear weapons, each one over a thousand times more powerful than the devices detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. But in order to power and arm this fleet, India will need a large stockpile of sufficiently enriched uranium. According to a recent investigation by Foreign Policy magazine, a new top secret facility is under construction in the South Indian district of Chalakere. And it is here that many believe the highly enriched uranium needed to fulfill India's military ambitions will be produced. Though, this is a claim that has been hotly contested by the Indian government itself. So, I've come to the expo to seek out India's top defence and military leaders and see if they will explain what is going on. Our first port of call is the Defence Minister's press conference where I ask him about these alleged plans to build a new uranium enrichment site. You are asking me something which I cannot tell you. You are also aware of it. But I can tell you this much that the country is very much sensitive about its need and all needs are being monitored and we are attempting to get things even before time, scheduled time. His answer is evasive, but that's not really surprising. Indian officials are famously tight-lipped about the country's nuclear weapons program because it is covered by a draconian Official Secrets Act. We hear the same evasive responses from a long list of people at the Defence Expo. Something you're concerned about. I don't want to talk about that. It's not our area. We ran into the same apparent wall of silence when we approached the company that built India's first nuclear submarine. It's good really not to talk about something which the country must manage its own uh, secrecy. Even the country's vice chief of naval staff was unwilling to address the subject. It is a great achievement. And does it enhance our capacity significantly? Enough. One, one question is enough. While India is keen to discuss and debate its growing military prowess, the nuclear weapons program is a subject that remains off limits. But many analysts across the world believe that India is indeed pursuing a policy of creating thermonuclear weapons many times more powerful than anything in the country's arsenal to date. If you're saying that we are enlarging our arsenal, yes we are. And India's historical foe, Pakistan, 
has already taken note, pledging to do whatever it takes to keep up with Indian nuclear capability. Whether they want to uh, turn Pakistan into rubble or evaporate that rubble into uh, uh, vapors, uh, that, that should not bother me much. As long as I can uh, retaliate and cause substantial damage on India. With regional superpower China already holding a vast stockpile of these weapons, experts fear a new nuclear race on the subcontinent could threaten the existence and livelihoods of half of the world's population. The race is also taking a bad shape in South Asia because India's concerns are with respect to China as well. So India builds up against, uh, against China and uh, India wants to have, for example, a triad, which means nuclear weapons on, on the air as well as on the seas and submarines and so on and so forth. But concerns that India is planning to expand its nuclear arsenal first came to light in a rather unlikely backwater of rural South India, the lush plains of Chalakere. It was here that a group of local shepherds unearthed details about the government's alleged plans to construct a secret nuclear city. For generations, shepherds like Dasra Buraya had unfettered access to common pasture lands here, stretching over thousands of acres. They used this land to grow food and graze their animals. But in 2010, the Indian government suddenly ordered that 10,000 acres of these common grasslands be walled off. No information about the intended purpose of the new facilities was made public and local community members claimed they were not even consulted or informed about the appropriation of this land before it happened almost overnight. Even local politicians and civil servants had been kept in the dark. Then, in 2011, India's top nuclear official admitted that among the projects slated for construction in Chalakere is a uranium enrichment site that could feed the country's military nuclear programs as well as civilian. This announcement came shortly after the launch of INS Arihant, the first of several nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines being built for the Indian Navy. Slowly, this information made its way back to the local community in Chalakere. The villagers organized wide-scale protests to draw the attention of the government, including a mass boycott of the 2014 Indian general election. But it soon became clear to them that this was a battle that would have to be fought in court. So, they got in touch with environmental lawyer Leo Saldana. When the farmers discovered the walls were coming up, that's when, for almost four years it was secret, no? The farmers had already filed a case in the High Court, it was not going well for them, which is when we took it to the National Green Tribunal. In response to Leo's case at the Green Tribunal, government agencies were compelled to go on the record and reveal important information about the purpose of the Chalakere site. So they very clearly said that in their affidavits, to produce highly enriched uranium which is used by both civilian as well as military including for nuclear power, ballistic missiles and submarines etc. If you take what has happened in Iran, basically the IAEA and the United States government has forced a separation between the weapons grade uranium and the energy process. That separation is important so that there is no proliferation. Through the Shepherd's case, Leo managed to get a government agency to admit for the first time that the site will be used to enrich uranium to build weapons. According to national security expert Bharat Karnad, building a city-sized complex to house the entire process is not uncommon. 
best way to make a weapon and have an industry and, and an industrial sized process making a weapon to have it in one place. That's what the Russians have done. The Arazma 16, for instance, is a, just a city in some remote part of Siberia or something where they make nothing but bombs. So maybe we are adopting the Russian thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm merely saying as an outside person looking in, expert looking in, Arasma 16 is the kind of prototype we are following. Karnat's theory is credible, but it's nearly impossible to get any confirmation from the Indian government. Our search for more concrete answers takes us outside India to Washington, D.C. In 2008, India signed an historic deal with the United States, allowing international inspectors to regulate reactors used for its ambitious civilian nuclear energy program. In exchange, the country was granted a waiver from the nuclear suppliers group to import fuel and buy civilian nuclear technology that for decades had been kept out of its reach. Since then, Western analysts have monitored India's military program closely. At the Institute of Science and International Security, we meet Serena Vergentini, who's tracking the proposed enrichment site at Chalakere. We were able to discover the plan for the construction of a new enrichment facility by uh, analyzing open source information. This area up here does not have any construction so far, but the plans are to build a uranium centrifuge program here. Well, a new enrichment facility means that India will be expanding its stock of highly enriched uranium. Serena too is concerned that the new site could trigger a nuclear race in the subcontinent. It's significant because it indicates that India's uranium enrichment needs are growing. Um, and we believe they're growing because uh, India needs to fuel its nuclear submarine program. We worry about Pakistan because Pakistan has a tendency to want to match any new advancements that India makes. And uh, currently, we are worried that Pakistan might want to match India's efforts uh, when it comes to creating a nuclear submarine program. China is also nearby, and um, any um, advancements in this nuclear program are going to create, uh, are going to have destabilizing effects in the region. And yes, we worry about escalation. So if pursuing such a bullish policy on nuclear armament has the potential to destabilize the region, why exactly is it that the Indian government is so hell-bent on improving its arsenal? After all, the country already has nuclear weapons, doesn't it? In contrast to the big boys, new players, India and Pakistan, account for only 200 to 230 bombs between them. India's program dates back to 1974 when Prime Minister Indira Gandhi gave the go-ahead to test the country's first bomb. The smiling Buddha exploded deep in the heart of the Rajasthan desert, taking the world by surprise. India described it as a peaceful nuclear explosion. Pakistan saw it as an act of aggression. The nation reacted swiftly accelerating the pace of its own program. Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto grandly declared that Pakistanis would eat leaves and grass or even go hungry, but they would build the bomb. Things came to a head in May 1998, when under the cloak of secrecy, India tested five more bombs, a move that led to swift condemnation from the world. Less than three weeks later, in a tit-for-tat move, Pakistan detonated six devices. Sanctions were placed on both nations. While the tests proved conclusively that both nations had nuclear capability, a shadow was cast over the credibility of India's deterrent in 2009. That year, K. Santanam, a key member of the scientific team responsible for conducting the tests, made a shocking revelation. The fact that the uh, thermonuclear test um, uh, gave a yield much lower than was predicted. It was obvious, but for some reasons that was um, kept hidden. And then we motored down to where the thermonuclear tests had occurred, and one could see plainly with a naked man's eye or whatever that uh, the shaft was intact, indicating that uh, the 
yield of the thermonuclear test was not what was claimed to be. The government was quick to refute his allegations. But Santanam's claims were seized upon by those national security experts such as Bharat Karnad, who have been calling for further testing and asking the government to build a full-scale thermonuclear arsenal. Our only proven and tested weapon is a 20 kiloton. We claim we have 175, we claim we have 225, we claim we have a 275. But unless you actually test, uh, there's no credibility to your claims. If it's a mind game, before the nuclear war starts, the Chinese have an edge. Because when you say, okay, the Chinese say, okay, you want to start a nuclear war? Okay, I'm going to open up with my one megaton. And what do you have? A very accurate 20 kiloton? Okay, fine. Not everyone shared this enthusiasm for further proliferation, but Santanam's revelations had left those on all sides of the political spectrum wondering whether India's arsenal was sufficient to deter its enemies, particularly Pakistan, with whom the country's relations have often descended into violence. In fact, hostility has been a defining characteristic of the relationship between India and Pakistan for nearly 70 years now, a period marked by several wars and endless military standoffs. And this mutual enmity is perhaps best illustrated by a ceremony that takes place at the Waga border every evening. Both sides put on a grand show of aggression, cheered on by their countrymen. But even this spectacle underplays the very real threat that both nations pose to one another. Now both India and Pakistan continue to develop new nuclear weapons. Today, Pakistan has the world's fastest growing nuclear weapons program and India's nuclear weapons aspirations are on the rise as well. With China looming large over both these nations, many fear that a new nuclear weapons race is breaking out on the subcontinent. We arrive on May 28th, 18 years to the day since Pakistan tested its bombs. Adding fuel to the fire of hostility between Pakistan and India is this man, A.Q. Khan, the father of the Pakistani bomb. He's a controversial figure, accused of setting up a proliferation network that leaked sensitive information to Libya, North Korea and Iran. We were able to sneak past Khan's heavy security detail to attend a ceremony where he was giving a speech. The Pakistani government has publicly distanced itself from Khan, but he continues to be a celebrated figure up and down the country. Getting access to Khan is nearly impossible. But we are able to arrange a meeting with another insider from Pakistan's nuclear program. Brigadier Salik is a former high-ranking member of Pakistan's Strategic Planning Division, an elite branch of the military that has command over the country's nuclear arsenal. We meet Salik at Kerde Azam University in Islamabad, where he tells us that in the wake of revelations about India's nuclear ambitions, Pakistan has no choice but to escalate the production of its own weapons. People are generally willing to accept India's logic that their main security threat is from China. In terms of strategic weapons as well, if there's a missile 
or a nuclear weapon uh, which the indians may claim that it is intended for china what stop it uh, stops indians from pointing the same weapon towards pakistan whatever india does we should be able to in a retaliatory mode uh, cause uh, unbearable damage to india so they they will hopefully refrain from bothering pakistan in the first place but pakistan's dismal record on non proliferation has always been a huge concern globally and the recent introduction of tactical nuclear weapons to its arsenal short range missiles equipped with nuclear warheads that can be used on the battlefield have caused many particularly indian military officials to balk in horror given the fact that a substantial part of pakistan's forces is engaged in counter terrorism operations on the western borders so that has created a kind of vulnerability which indians seem to be uh, willing to exploit so pakistan had to look for uh, solutions to that and pakistan's response to this was then in, by the way of introduction of uh, short range battlefield nuclear weapons so we are lowering our nuclear threshold pakistan has also delegated the command of tactical nukes to battlefield commanders which some analysts believe leaves their arsenal worryingly open to attack and even theft by extremist organizations in the region for his part pakistani peace activist and physicist ah nayar expects things will only get worse in the years to come the race is also taking a bad shape in south asia because the south asian situation is not just india pakistan situation because india's concerns are with respect to china as well so india builds up against uh, against china and uh, india wants to have for example a triad which means nuclear weapons on on the air as well as on the seas and submarines and so on so forth and therefore um pakistan would feel more threatened and pakistan will also go in that direction for those who track strategic weapons closely one area where the race is most apparent is in the building and testing of bomb delivery systems such as missiles both india and pakistan have a large stockpile of such systems most recently india tested a ballistic missile from on board its first nuclear powered submarine leading to fears that the indian ocean is on course to become a nuclearized zone in november 2015 even us president barack obama voiced his own concerns about the direction south asia is taking at the nuclear security summit in washington dc the other area where i think we need to see progress is uh, pakistan and india that subcontinent making sure that uh, as they develop military doctrines that they are not continually uh, moving in the wrong direction india resents any attempts to link its nuclear security and doctrine with that of pakistan's and quickly protested president obama's remarks but for those charged with analyzing india's national security strategy expanding the program appears inevitable if you're saying that we are enlarging our arsenal yes we are we really ought to keep pace with china uh the other countries are not really threats to india so we don't india shouldn't really be concerned not pakistan not really pakistan is a you know i mean pakistan is a very small country because india is so large um pakistan can never be certain that our nuclear weapons can be destroyed in an exchange while we can be certain we can make pakistan extinct as a social organism the walls of chalakere continue to obscure india's alleged new nuclear program from view but many on all sides agree that a nuclear arms race on the subcontinent is underway The potential fallout in this volatile region is unthinkable. And while the Indian state seeks to secure its deterrent capabilities against its neighbors, a lot more thought must be given on how to prevent this race from spiraling out of control.